Okay, well, welcome. Uh, I'll, uh, some of you have met before, so uh, you will hear this again, but I'll introduce myself for the sake of the majority, which is new. My name is Zohar Aviv. I'm Israeli. Uh, in fact, uh, for the last uh, almost 15 years, lived in, the, in, in North America, and for a short time, almost a year in South Africa. Um, and did my graduate work in the United States. I'm a graduate of Brandeis. I did my PhD at the University of Michigan in, in Jewish thought and uh, mysticism, concentrating on the uh, uh, attempt to prove God's existence in rational thought. Uh, <coughs> I picked a nice thesis. I thought, let's go with that one. Um, and came back to Israel exactly uh, less than a year ago. Um, uh, to assume the position of, uh, uh, of uh, <coughs> Chief Education Officer of the Bleed Birthright International, uh, and also do things like this in Eretz HaKodesh, uh, where it's uh, needed no less than in the uh, diaspora. So thank you, first of all, for having me, Anat. And uh, I suggest that with no further ado, let us jump into the, uh, into the pool of knowledge. So you ready? Mm -hmm. Let's go. When we discuss uh, the issue of God, irrespective of religious vocabularies, uh, we discuss a topic, especially in the, uh, uh, in the modern world, we discuss a topic that usually associates with pe for people with the term monotheism. The unity of God or the singularity of God is something that is almost taken for granted, albeit with much, with, without too much clarity as to its meaning. And trust me when I say, that one is most likely one of the most elusive ideas in the universe. Because the question of the divine unity, we all say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloheinu, Hashem Echad, God is one, but we don't necessarily stop to ponder what is the nature of that unity and what is the nature of that God. And many times when you hear sermons by rabbis or lectures by scholars or by other figures, they seem to identify Judaism with a monotheistic concept. More than that, many of them would actually argue that the Jews had introduced monotheism into the civilized world. They would say the civilized world, or the non-civilized world, depends how you want to define it, were pagans. They believed in many, many gods. They worshipped uh, idols until we came and introduced the unity of God, the one God, this kind of an abstract idea, the grand notion of monotheism. As I always like to tell my students, nice, not necessarily true. Romantic, not necessarily authentic. And what we're going to do today is actually unpack the evolution of the idea of God in Judaism, and hopefully at the end of the two hours that we have together, you'll realize how many historical, social, nay, political reasons contributed to the way God was perceived by the Israelites and how the idea of what we call today classical monotheism, there is only one God and that God rules everything and everyone and everywhere, is actually a much later development in Judaism. Now, before we even go there, I would like to make a very, very clear distinction between three terms that again are used interchangeably by scholars, by thinkers, by lay people, and, uh, 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 and require uh, further clarification. And those terms are philosophy, theology, and religion. Philosophy, theology, and religion. Speaking of God, which is, in this case, the topic of, the, of, of our evening. Arguably, when we talk about God in philosophical discourse, we talk about God's, quote-unquote, essential attributes. What do I mean when I say God's essential attributes, quote-unquote? I mean those characteristics without which the human mind cannot comprehend of the term God. For example... For example, that God exists. How many of you are fluent? How many, how many of you are fluent with uh, Maimonides Moreneh Bochim, the guide for the perplexed? 
How many of you have heard of, about it? Okay, Moré Nevochim, right? The founder of the 13 Ikarim, the 13 foundations or pillars of belief, right? Anyone remembers what's the first? No. The existence of God. No, not I'm sorry? Like no, not believe, no, that God exists? No, 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 believe in God's existence, but that, that God's existence is the first pillar of belief. In other words, that it's beyond contestation. It is beyond criticism. And we'll, we'll touch it much, much later when we get to rational monotheism. This idea, by the way, of absolute necessary existence, which if you think even for one minute, realize that it doesn't necessitate anything else in this world, nothing has to exist. So here we're making a distinction between necessary existence and possible existence. Necessary existence is an essential attribute that is attributed to God alone. <coughs> so much so that it, it has its own philosophical term, aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y. Only God has aseity. Existence, hence, is an essential attribute. Another essential attribute, not surprising, unity. God is... God is, a seiri, God is one. Another essential attribute, absoluteness, all-encompassing. God is, God is one, God is absolutely one. You get the picture? Mm -hmm. Now, you don't? No, because you said that it encompasses, what does it encompass? Everything. Whatever the mind can... So, isn't there some kind of contradiction, one and everything? No, because actually if you think about it rationally, you'll see that if it is one, it must be everything. I'll give you an example, okay? How many objects do you see right now? One. How many objects do you see right now? Two. No, you see three. Why? Because in order to distinguish between with this one and this one, you have to, de to determine another one that is neither. In this case, the air between them. Oh, okay. So what we're talking about now, you understand what I just said? So what I'm talking about now is the ability of the human mind to conceive of a unity that encompasses everything. It's indivisible, and by nature, it has to be only one, because if it's two, it's divided. If it's small and there's something larger than it, then it's not absolutely one. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. We'll unpack this much, much more. I just want you to understand these are essential attributes and by the nature of being essential attributes, the human mind, what happens to the human mind is exactly what happened to you, my dear. It becomes confused. Or in other words, what in God's name, no pun intended, are you talking about? It's very amorphic. It's very abstract. Okay, so you tell me that God exists. God is one. God is all-encompassing. God is indivisible. Oh, nice. It doesn't tell me anything about this world. More than that, the essential attributes of divinity do not necessitate the existence of the universe. God can remain one, absolute, all-encompassing, and nothing, read no thing at the same time. So now come, did you understand what I just said? So if you get that, you obviously understand that in order to understand the raison d'etre of this universe, and we are part of it, we have to ask a different question. Okay, let's say I accept that God exists. But now I have to ask, why did God create the universe if the universe is not a necessary outcome of God's aseity? Which is, by the way, something that Aristotle would argue with because he couldn't solve this question. He would say, nay, the universe is a product of God's aseity. Hmm. Others would say, absolutely not. And now they ask the question, why did God create the universe? For what purpose was this world created? Here is another philosophical term, ironically coming from Aristotle himself. What is the teleology behind creation, the purpose? In Hebrew, or better yet in Yiddish, tachlis. What is it made for? That, my friend, is no longer a philosophical question, but a theological question. 
the fact that God exists or the question regarding God's existence is philosophical. The question about the reason for creation and our creation in it is theological. And without getting into that, because that's a, a lecture unto itself, no, actually a course unto itself, let me tell you right at this point that suffice it to say that the answer of all great theologies mm -hmm. is that the backbone of creation, the raison d'etre, the universe's teleology, as it were, is in so many words ethical to make this place better. In Judaism, we know this term in the modern world as tikkun olam. How can that be the reason when it could have been created perfect? I'm sorry? How can that be the reason when it could have been created perfect? Where it could have been or couldn't have been? Could have. Ah, now, you, now you're talking about another theological question. If God could have created the world perfect, how come he had it? That's another theological question. What I'm making the, I want to make a distinction right now at this junction between philosophy and theology. Theology requires a question like you just asked. Why did God create the world? Why did God create the world like the way he did? Why did God create uh, uh, male and female? Why did, God, why did God create the tree of knowledge between good and evil? Why were we tempted to be? Oh, right, there's this, this, this great Chinese joke that says, if Adam and Eve were Chinese, we wouldn't be in this predicament because Eve would have eaten the snake. <laughs> which you can call a theological joke. But theology, in so many words, revolves around questions of purpose, rather about questions of existence. That's all I want you to remember at this point. This is not the purpose of this lecture. The purpose of this lecture is, first of all, to give you the lay of the land so we can focus on our discussion today. Mm -hmm. So now comes the human and ask a question. Okay, God wants me to use myself as an extension of divinity. And all great theologies perceive the human as an extension of divinity. In Judaism, it's known as chedek elo animal, a part of God above, an extended arm, an extended mouth. Could you skip a step here? Because uh, that's the purpose of creating man, that is, that, that man should make this a perfect place. But you were talking about um, before you got into this piece about man being ethical, why did God create the world? Again, you didn't, you didn't answer that. If you ask a theo if you ask a theologian, yeah, the whole world is a stage for the human to to fulfill its potential as part of God. The world in and of itself, without the human, I'm talking from a theological standpoint, from a theological standpoint. Theologies are by nature homocentric. They see the human as the center of creation, or as it's called, the crown of creation. The world is a stage for you to turn the world from a world in which you live into a world in which you believe. To make this world something that adheres more adequately to the divine charge. That, that's man's charge. The, the way man perceives the divine charge. That's a human product, theology. Absolutely. The way the human perceives God's charge from the man is his response to theology. Now, so, so God, God created uh, the world, mm -hmm. the universe, yeah. be only for the purpose of later on creating man. Well... If you ask for it depends yeah. If you ask for example a theologian he would say to you, Yeah, just read Genesis chapter one. That's the structure. I'm not talking about truth here, guys. I want you to understand. I'm giving you the lay of the land as it has been as it evolved for thousands of years. I'm just wanting to make clear that you understand what I mean when I say philosophy, theology, religion. I don't necessarily agree with a certain theological view or philosophical view but I still need you to understand it so we can create a shared language, okay?